much. Uh, thanks, everybody. This has been a really fantastic day. My name is Jean Cook. I'm the Director of Programs for Future of Music Coalition. I'm also a musician, and I've been with FMC for about five years. I'm very pleased to be bringing you the final panel of the day, which I am very, very aware is the last thing between you and the cocktail party. And it's Creative Capital, Music, Culture, and Policy under Obama. Um, I did want to remind you that we are using the hashtag FMC10 on Twitter. And, uh, and for those of you, uh, that's for all of you in the room who are Twittering, I, I was watching most of you guys commenting on the previous proceedings, but also for those of you who are on the webcast. Now, these folks that we have here are very important people. They're very busy people, and they've been very generous with their time. I did want to offer a quick caveat up front. There's a lot going on on the Hill today, so there's a possibility that one or two of them may have to run out in case they're needed. Uh, they don't control their own schedule. So if that happens, please don't assume it's because they've decided that they've had enough of the conversation. <laughs> so um, we've purposely put together a panel that covers um, both the House and the Senate, uh, folks who work on a range of issues from IP to telecom and also the arts. Um, this isn't really meant to be a comprehensive panel per se. It's really impossible to talk about everything that's going on, obviously. But we did want to create a platform for leaders on the Hill to talk about what they're working on, where they think Congress is going, where they'd like Congress to go, and uh, most importantly, um, how the public can be engaged in these debates uh, in an effective way. That's, that's helpful. So by way of introduction, I wanted to ask uh, each of you to kind of talk a little bit about kind of one or two initiatives that you're working on that you're excited about. Of course, you should tell us a little bit about yourself, your roles, um, who you work for, kind of the scope of your work. Um, and uh, you should talk about one or two initiatives you're working on that you're excited about, an issue that you think impacts musicians and the arts community, the status, how can the arts folks kind of participate and get engaged. and. Um, just to be fun, can you tell us also uh, the last show or the last record that you bought? <laughs> and uh, why don't we go ahead and start with Sean Chang. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I, I'll try my best to make sure that everyone uh, get to your cocktail uh, with plenty of time. So. Um, uh, my name is Sean Chang. I'm one of the counselors over at the House Energy and Commerce Committee. I work for Chairman Waxman from California. Uh, he's been the chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee since the beginning of the 111th uh, Congress. Uh, in that capacity, uh, myself and my coworkers work on a wide range of telecommunications related issues. Um, and my uh, most specific portfolio, I work on wireless and spectrum issues for the most part. And I do believe spectrum issues uh, is something that uh, does impact um, musicians as, as, um, as um, the arts uh, community reach out to uh, more diverse platforms of uh, distribution of their uh, work. Um, the uh, mobile universe is becoming increasingly important and the fact that um, many commentators have identified the reality that the United States is facing uh, a spectrum crisis uh, is, is crucial for the future of uh, mobile broadband in the United States. And, and towards that goal, um, we've worked together, both the House and Senate side have taken up the uh, Spectrum Inventory Act to look comprehensively at um, the way in which we currently hold and use spectrum by various licensees and try to discover any place where there's inefficiency and so we can create a process to rededicate some of those um, capacities for, uh, for broadband mobile communications. So that's one of the key initiatives I'm very excited about. I think I'm going to ask Matt if we can ever get the bill out of the Senate, and then we can uh, get the Senate before the end of the year. But I don't know if he has the answer or not. But uh, we've, we've worked on that issue on a very collegial, bipartisan manner um, on the House side, and the legislation has passed out of the House. So we're just, it's pending Senate action right now. Uh, the last piece of uh, record or film or whatever that I purchased. Ah, I need to think about that one. Uh, I haven't, I really haven't bought anything for a little while. I think uh, um, I, I, I just purchased a season pass of Modern Family. I don't know if that helps. So <laughs> it's on, on Apple, so. Uh, 
Hi. <clears throat> as as Sean has said, I work in the Senate. We are on the spectrum inventory bill. We're 99% there, almost. But it just shows the incredible power that one senator can have. We're actually working with that office to kind of address his concerns about the legislation. And certainly my boss is optimistic that we will uh, work through that to a resolution, hopefully in the near term, because it is certainly a, a critical step in addressing the future uh, spectrum needs of all users, whether it's wireless broadband, whether it's uh, federal use for public safety or, or radar, what have you, because there is certainly a significant amount of uh, spectrum being uh, used currently in a whole a host of different ways. But I will say, you know, it is a pleasure to be here uh, and talking about these issues and certainly, you know, in reaching out to all of you that aren't necessarily able to, to make it to the Hill as frequently as some others. Uh, it's always great to have your input, but, you know, certainly in regards to the issues that my boss um, is really interested in in, re in the telecommunications issues, it is with Spectrum. Uh, that's certainly, uh, I mean, just what we have seen in the increased mobility, productivity, and accessibility is absolutely, uh, you know, just amazing, to say the least. And so it is important that we uh, have the proper policy in place so that we can move forward to reach even greater potential in innovation in, um, in wireless. And again, that's with whether it's broadband or any other type of communications or spectrum uh, dependent uh, services. Another issue that is obviously important, and I won't go into much detail because I think they were talking about it earlier, is network neutrality. My boss has certainly been a longtime champion of network neutrality because of how empowering and transformational the internet has been to internet users. I think roughly about at least 60 percent of content online is user generated, and if you look at the you know five of the top ten websites, uh, most popular websites. They're, they're forums or, or places to go for users to go, whether it's to socialize, whether it's to post content, uh, or other to conduct uh, commerce. So it's showing that just is such an amazing uh, medium that we have never seen before in, in telecommunications. So it's absolutely essential to provide fundamental protections uh, to preserve the unfettered and open act access that has been instrumental to the, it's, the Internet's growth, adoption, and innovation. So that's it's such an exciting thing. Certainly uh, the FCC, FCC is moving forward with that uh, and there has been some talk on the on the Hill as well. My boss has continued to have conversations with Senator Dorgan and other staff, other members uh, to explore legislative options. So that's always on the table but certainly we have seen some, you know, we're seeing the FCC address this and I know that there's, that's a very contentious way that they are attempting to do that. Uh, so we'll see how that certainly plays out. And uh, my boss has certainly uh, applauded uh, Sean's boss as others, uh, I guess yesterday I'm mentioning about the exploring the opportunity to do a telecom rewrite that some of my boss actually has conveyed in the past her, her strong support uh, for. And because we do really need to kind of update these laws uh, to better reflect the, the, the 21st century uh, infrastructure and technologies that are being employed and certainly have more flexibility and greater and more appropriate enforcement uh, of these issues in, in a manner. Because as we know, the, the Internet is an ecosystem. There's kind of an equilibrium, if you will, between broadband and content. I mean, they both need each other in order to survive. And so we have to make sure that they flourish uh, as best as possible, that we can incentivize investment and competition in broadband access as well as allow uh, the optimization of, of traffic just as what we have seen with uh, industry-led groups, collaborative groups such as P4P, making sure that um, real-time traffic is optimized in appropriate manner versus non-real-time traffic so that because as we know, you know, IP was initially you know, developed, the internet was initially developed to do large transfers of data between uh, campuses and IP in its very nature is, is best effort and what we have seen is through uh, various open standards development through the ITF, IEEE, you know, developing standards that will allow the delineation in an appropriate manner uh, to deliver these traffics and that's something that certainly will be to able to enhance the experience 
that consumers receive as well as the benefit to all the small businesses and content developers out there wanting to provide their, their systems. So th that's one of the very exciting things that we see is just the continued innovation that is occurring. Uh, lastly, another issue that the center, and this is the last one I'll, I'll touch on, is, is with the FCC, about FCC reform. One of, the thing, one of the items that my boss has been very interested in is enhancing or bolstering the technical resources at the FCC because you know these are incredibly complex issues uh, at the forefront that they are examining with the broad, uh, national broadband plan. There are some very technical uh, recommendations and initiatives that they're going to move forward with. And the FCC, unfortunately, over the past several decades, we have seen an incredibly significant depletion of engineers on staff to where at one point, uh, back I think uh, several decades ago, they accounted for roughly 50% of the uh, FCC workforce. Now they only constitute about 15%. And it is one of those things that is uh, very concerning given the dynamics of the industry, how rapid uh, the industry is evolving and how we have seen uh, bottlenecks, if you will, for technical waivers and rulemakings at the FCC that should take only a couple months that end up taking uh, and sometimes excess of several years to, to actually uh, have a ruling or to conclude. And so we really feel that there's a need to have greater technical resources so that that'll be a benefit uh, to the consumer and to the end users because that'll mean more innovation coming down the pipeline in, in a, a more expeditious manner. In regards to the last concert I saw, I think it was Fog Hat Reunion Tour 1993. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but no, I, I, this shows you. One, of the, I was actually supposed to go see Widespread Panic. You know, I'm actually from Athens, Georgia, see my homeboys. But um, you know, I actually had a had to stay in the Senate because of an issue on the floor, so I had to miss that concert. Uh, last album I downloaded, I kid you not, this series. Uh, I actually downloaded, I think, uh, Bad Brains. If anyone's in the you know, hardcore DC punk saying underground. So, I, and excuse me, they're Soul Brain now. They're called Soul Brains now because, really? yeah, because of, uh, well, I won't get into that. But yeah, <laughs> and I have actually seen them in concert at 930 Club. I got to say, it was probably one of the most impressive shows I have ever seen. It was really impressive. So, so I leave it at that. I'm sorry I talked too much, but I'm in the Senate. So. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Maggie Julian with Congresswoman Louise Slaughter. Uh, my boss is the co-chair of the Arts Caucus in the House, and I'm pleased to say our numbers have gotten up over 225. I forgot to look up the exact number, and for that I apologize. But we are over 225 members in the House are very engaged and interested in these issues. And I'm really glad to come here today and talk to you a little bit about the best way to connect the two. I mean, we've got this big movement here. I mean, we, our numbers before Arts Advocacy Day were uh, about 190. So just even having a one day with all the artists come onto the hill made a big impact on these members. Um, so for you know a few of the arts issues that I, I cover for my boss, I mean part of it is corralling these members to kind of un have them uh, have understanding of what kind of art policy we're working on. And our number one issue every year is funding, um, NEA funding, arts and education funding, and so. Uh, you know, as those uh, bills come through, which we, they hopefully will this Congress, I mean, no one really knows yet, I think, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll be, uh, keep our thumb on the pulse of that and make sure that all of our caucus members understand the importance of the funding and have message points because I think that that's one of the big problems for us on the Hill is getting members to talk about the arts publicly and knowing how to talk about it and how to reframe it at, so it's not a, you know, a fluffy issue, which I know none of you feel that way and neither do I, but it's hard to engage with folks and to really get people excited and passionate about the issue. So that's kind of one of my main jobs is to ensure that all of our members have all the information they need to be able to support the arts in their district and to work with their constituencies and to ensure that we are bolstering our uh, cultural exchange in, in the U.S. and making sure that we are leaders um, in the world on arts and culture. Um, and then uh, generally, uh, kind of another initiative I've been playing with for a while is kind of <coughs> doing a Women in the Arts Day um, to kind of draw attention to all that women have accomplished in the arts. My boss is a was used to serve on the Women's Caucus, so, and she's, you know, the first woman to serve as the chairwoman of the Rules Committee. She's very passionate about that, in addition to the fact that she's a former blues singer. I'm not sure if you knew that. So, a musician herself, uh, she's very committed, especially to the combination. So, that's something I've been working on for a few months um, to try and get something to make a really big splash. Um, 
and you know just generally making sure that we're on top of anything that might change um, you know in the arts community and policy anything new that comes out um, the arts caucus I know you all have been talking about net neutrality um, but the arts caucus hasn't quite weighed in on that yet because we have so many different opinions and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that a lot of members don't have a full understanding of the issue and ha the effect on musicians and, and artists generally. And I think that that is a, a place where the musicians um, and the arts community can really have a big uh, play, uh, coming to the Hill or talking to the member if you're from their district. I think explaining the, the effect of it that it would have on you as a musician and your business or, um, you know, et cetera, is going to be critical to making sure that we get this through in the right way because it's people aren't weighing in yet, at least um, for, as a public arts caucus, you know, outpour. Um, and yeah, basically, I'd, I'd say one of my biggest jobs as the arts caucus staff is corralling members and ensuring that we are all sticking, uh, you know, to the same initiatives. I think the best part about the arts caucus is that we get to work on issues that people feel very passionately about. Um, you know, just to reference Arts Advocacy Day, when everybody came on the Hill, everybody was so excited. I mean, I've never seen members with smiles on their faces on the day in session when they're not running around with their heads in their Blackberry. I mean, I think that the power of the arts is very obvious, and uh, you can see it you can see it in uh, people's faces, and I think that that is an effect that we need to kind of bolster a little more. We need more people to come to the Hill because it's too stuffy, and uh, we, could, we could use some, uh, some things to talk positively about. Um, and about, I'm going to tell you my last concert I went to. Is that all right? <laughs> um, I saw Mike Snow at the 930 Club. Unfortunately, I, I don't, had too much time to do too many show hopping, and they don't pay us enough to buy too many albums. But uh, that was my last uh, show that I went to, and I'm very honored to be here with all of you today. Thanks. I'm honored to be here as well. My name is Ben Staub. I work for uh, Mr. Conyers and the House Judiciary Committee. And Mr. Conyers is, of uh, course, a member from Detroit, long, long time uh, champion of, of artist issues. And so uh, I think his main push uh, during this Congress would be the Performance Rights Act, uh, H.R. 848 uh, in the House, S-379, which we're happy to have Mr. Durbin uh, carrying over there as well. Um, the Performance Rights Act, I'm not sure is everybody sort of familiar with it, not familiar with it? Basically, uh, when you hear a song on the radio, uh, only the songwriter gets paid for that quote unquote performance of that piece. The actual singers and musicians playing backup uh, don't, get comp don't get a royalty. Uh, whereas on satellite radio or uh, cable radio, and uh, uh, when you hear webcasts, the performers and the songwriters get paid. So. The Performance Rights Act would really close that loophole and require some sort of remuneration for the performance on AMFM terrestrial radio. Uh, so that bill has met uh, a lot of opposition from, you would guess, uh, AMFM radio. I'm sure some of you have heard uh, the National Association of Broadcasters ads or other ads against the Performance Rights Act. So for musicians, I think we think of this truly as an issue of fairness. Um, you know, fair play for airplay is one of the, the slogans that's been running around. But I think in Mr. Conyers' mind, uh, no one, or everyone, deserves to be paid for their work. No one should go uncompensated. And artists uh, often, you know, they inspire us. The, you know, the music that they perform kind of is the, you know, soundtrack that we all walk and live to. And he thinks, and, and I think as well, that, you know, they deserve to be paid uh, for their work. So. There are negotiations happening right now um, behind closed doors at this point between uh, the, the major stakeholders, which include the unions, the artist unions, the record labels, um, and the coalition uh, pushing the Performance Rights Act and uh, radio interests, the, the National Association of Broadcasters and some key radio stations. We're told that headway is being made, and we're very hopeful that, that a compromise can be reached, whether it looks like a sliding scale uh, for radio stations like the bills in the House and Senate do now, or or some other um, compromise. We're, we're we're very open, and I think Mr. Conyers wants to see the parties work it out before kind of pushing something through the House or through the Senate. So um, happy to take any questions on that. But hopefully, um, as artists yourselves, uh, you've you've heard of the the campaign for this bill, and um, we would welcome any support that you can give to make sure that that artists are paid for their work. Um, Mr. Conyers uh, is also. Um, 
a longtime supporter of net neutrality, uh, and I think we're, we're very grateful, actually, to, to you all in this group for helping us with the last hearing we had on net neutrality. You guys helped us get the group OK Go uh, to testify before us, who kind of um, became an internet sensation with their music videos and, and uh, have long uh, talked about uh, the importance of network neutrality. I think for, for us in our office, um, we're huge uh, supporters of copyright and we're huge supporters of net neutrality and we don't see them as opposed and I think uh, opponents to net, uh, to net neutrality have been able to kind of create that as a wedge and so as an artist's group we would hope that you all could help us get the word out that net neutrality and copyright protection are not opposing they you know we, we support only lawful content being a, uh, accessed fairly on the internet, not illegal content. So as we watch what the FCC is doing and um, develop a plan moving forward on how we can make sure that, that net neutrality is um, here to stay, we'll, we'll be looking for a nuanced and, and uh, appro a nuanced approach that accounts for that. So thank you all very much. Good afternoon. My name is Dan Swanson, and I will admit up front that I pursued a career as a Capitol Hill staffer only after I couldn't cut it as a professional musician. I have great respect for the work that you all do, and uh, happy to tell you a little bit about what we do. I am a counsel on the Senate Judiciary Committee. That committee is chaired by Senator Pat Leahy of Vermont. I actually work for Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois, who is chair of the Human Rights and the Law Subcommittee. I handle a number of issues for the center, including intellectual property. And I will echo what Ben said, that you have some great champions for your issues relating to intellectual property um, in both the House and Senate Judiciary Committees. Chairman Conyers, Chairman Leahy, Senator Durbin are all big supporters of the Performance Rights Act and want to reaffirm uh, what Ben said, that this is an issue that we need to get addressed here. It's a matter of basic fairness. Uh, it is an anomaly in the copyright law which has stood for far too long and needs to be addressed. Uh, and hopefully we will address it soon. Uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, has its agenda mapped out for it for the next few months. Uh, as you know, we have a Supreme Court nominee who's been announced, and that will dominate our time, uh, most likely up until the August uh, recess period that the Senate takes. Uh, keep an eye out for that. You never know when intellectual property issues become an issue uh, in the nomination uh, hearings that we have there. Uh, but there are a number of other intellectual property items on our agenda which we hope to pursue uh, if the time allows for the remainder of the year. Uh, Performance Rights Act has passed out of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, it is now uh, in the queue of items that we hope to bring to the Senate floor. The way Senate procedure works, it's frequently hard to bring items to the floor unless it is a big bill, just as a function of the amount of time it takes to clear filibusters to get items to the floor. So there is a, a, a desire to find an appropriate <coughs> vehicle, a bill that we could potentially uh, move the Performance Rights Act on. Um, I will say that the last concert that I went to was actually a uh, reception honoring uh, Chairman Conyers, Senator Durbin, and other members uh, for their support for the Performance Rights Act. Garth Brooks was being honored there as well, and we assumed that Garth was going to be serenading the, the members of Congress. As it turned out, they asked the members of Congress to serenade Garth Brooks. Uh, I do think the, the video of that is available on the web. I won't tell you where, but it was an interesting show. So thanks for having us all here. I did forget what my, uh, I, the, I actually downloaded uh, just this weekend uh, Muddy Waters, the blues singer, a big compilation of his. But uh, the last concert I went to was probably that or the, uh, I think ASCAP put together a big concert with Tracy Chapman and uh, a bunch of other songwriters. It was great. So that was the last one. So thank you, everybody. Um, we are going to be taking questions in about 15 minutes or so, so please get them ready. And uh, also for those who are on the webcast, uh, to make sure that you use the Twitter hashtag so we can catch your questions. As a follow-up to some of your introductions, um, I guess we can start with Sean and Matthew. You mentioned Spectrum Inventory as a priority for your bosses. As you may know, the arts community, they're very supportive of making Spectrum available to the public and promoting innovation in that space. Uh, but there's also been the tiny outstanding question about transition costs to relocate current Spectrum users. Uh, this is such as wireless microphone users. Um, this is something that we know the FCC has been looking at, and I'm wondering if people have been coming to you about this as well. Uh, 
that this is an issue that is on the center's radar. We have uh, engaged with uh, the wireless mic community and are at this point just uh, monitoring it very closely. I mean, this is one of the issues that does exist. Is that you know, spectrum is uh, for all intents and purposes uh, is a scarce resource. It's already been allocated. We can't manufacture any uh, new amount of it. And you know, given physics. And in power requirements, et cetera, where you are in spectrum bands, uh, certain things will only work. Certain applications and services will only work in in that. So it is a very crowded space, certainly in the urban areas, uh, which makes it you know which really compounds the problem. Uh, but we do understand that the FCC is trying to work through these. And um, as far as any legislator from our end, some of we are not necessarily getting you know that deep in in regards to that because we feel the FCC certainly has the authority to go move forward in trying to bring a proper resolution to that. In regards to spectrum inventory, uh, my boss has also announced her intentions to introduce a more comprehensive bill because the inventory is only the first step. We got to really promote uh, technological innovation to improve spectrum efficiency and capacity as well as more robust spectrum management so that we can increase the, you know, again, the efficiency and capacity by you know, using different types of practices to allow, you know, unused spectrum to be used more effectively uh, and have, so therefore more users could be uh, using spectrum at various points in in time or space or geography. So something we are uh, investigating and talking with the FCC and NTA about to explore those options. So I know I deviated a little bit, but the idea is really to try to see how we can provide an appropriate policy and regulatory mechanism so that we don't have to be pushing people off or seeing expensive re relocation efforts, but certainly a more harmonious approach to the various uh, uses that do exist. Um, my boss and the committee hasn't really waiting on, on the 700 megahertz uh, microphone relocation issues. And I, I agree with Matt, and I think the FCC has the technical expertise and resources to really kind of fig figure out the best solution um, in terms of accommodating uh, their relocation process as well as addressing the needs of the, the licensees that spend a lot of money purchasing the spectrum and is ready to roll out. Uh, 4G services uh, ac across the country. Um, we are, uh, the chairman is very supportive, however, of a, a bill that has been introduced by Congressman Inslee uh, in terms of improving the relocation process when it comes down to federal agencies, making sure that there's money up front for them to access and uh, and plan for relocation process if such process has been dictated and certain agencies have to move to different spectrum. We want to make sure that they have all the money they need to do the proper planning so that the relocation process can be efficient and it's predictable and um, and we have the, the proper accounting of the costs as, that's actually associated with that. So so generally we're, we're supportive of, of, uh, of uh, making sure that the federal agencies are well compensated for their efforts and that they also have the opportunity to update and upgrade their equipment as we move forward. And now a more general question. Um, you touched a little bit on, and I'm hoping maybe you could focus as a panel on the questions of kind of what do arts folks come and see you about, people from the music and the creative communities, and what do you wish they would come to talk to you about that they don't come and talk to you about so often? Maggie, you mentioned uh, arts folks uh, talking to folks about why net neutrality is important. We talked about the PRA and um, the message about net neutrality and copyright protection not being in opposition. Are there other things that come to mind when you think about the arts community and what they can come and talk to you about? I'll, I'll go first with that. Um, one thing that I always note um, in my meetings with arts groups is that, um, in my opinion, I think members don't understand the full impact that the arts have on local communities, and it's something that I always bring up um, as, as a, um, hopefully a precursor to future meetings that we can talk about, you know, there are just a, a number, like for instance, I met, I know, I think the first time I met Jean was last year, we were talking about um, 
Sweet Home New Orleans. Um, the, this, I don't know if you all are familiar, but it's an organization um, for musicians uh, to help um, help people and, and people, musicians and the community to kind of get out of, the, of their um, unending poverty that they found themselves in down there. And it just those kind of stories and that kind of work is something that I feel really allows people to connect on a on a um, practical level with with the effect of musicians and artists on. Um, on the United States and if you break it down to a local level and tell a member exactly the effect that you or your organization has on the community it makes a real effect and, and I know that for us we don't have statistics to lean on I mean we, we don't necessarily you know we'll come in with a PowerPoint for every meeting sort of thing but I think that even just um, explaining the full impact I think is really critical for members to understand um, how important it is for us to keep arts um, you know, funded at a high level and ensuring that it trickles all the way down to the local communities. Um, and, and I think especially in times where the economy has been tough, uh, the, the artists have, have pulled through this in a way that other groups have not. And I think that that is a positive message to share with members while also bringing the attention back to the importance of, uh, of their support. And I think that until you can hook a member or a staffer um, on something that they can really connect to their district, it's, it's, hard, it's a hard way to focus energy. So I think that that's one thing that I would love to hear more about is, is uh, how artists affect the local communities. And I think that that is a message that would resonate really well with a lot of members, especially members that are looking to get involved. Um, like I said, our, our caucus is huge, but there's only so many things on our agenda that we can, people can take leads on, et cetera, and I think um, that uh, the effect on local communities is something that we don't touch on enough on the Hill. So that's you know, one thing. Well, I would say that almost as important as what you say to congressional staff is how often you say it. Uh, I've been working on the Hill for five years, which makes me a grizzled veteran uh, among Hill staff. It is a fact that there is uh, high turnover rates uh, among Hill staff. You frequently have new staff who come in and take over the set or the portfolio of issues that you care about. and especially in judiciary land where we're dealing with uh, some pretty uh, arcane intricacies of patent, copyright, trademark law, it's tough stuff. And frequently it's hard to make those issues real for congressional staff unless you come in and explain how it affects your life and your business model. Uh, I think it is important to make it an annual event, um, to contact your congressional office. Uh, you will build relationships with staffers who are there for a long time and you'll educate the new staffers who come in all the time uh, and keep them apprised of these issues. Uh, I do think uh, democracy works best when, when folks like you interact with your offices and let them know what, what's important to you uh, and do it at least once a year. Yeah, I, would, I would just add, um, we love meeting with artists and I think some of the most powerful meetings that we take are when, you know, on judiciary we're looking at, you know, licenses and contracts and things. Um, when we're trying to write legislative language, but then when we're talking to artists, we're often talking, you know, in atmospherics. And I think, again, some of the most powerful meetings are when artists tell us, you know, I got a check, for, you know, a songwriter says, I got a check from BMI for X amount of dollars, and that's what I'm supposed to live on. So I think that if you can make the meetings that you have with decision makers as concrete as possible, making it, you know, as, as personalized and as you're willing to, you know, when, when we talk about, you know, a particular royalty or a particular, um, you know, arrangement, it's helpful to say, well, there's this song happening in this television show and this artist only got X amount of dollars for that. That really is very, very helpful in addition to bringing us legislative language and, um, you know, you don't want to make us, you know, sob and cry with, you know, the woes of, of everybody, but it's very helpful for us to get examples of the the types of negotiations that you're entering into with whether it's a label or um, a, a content producer or whatever it is. I think those specifics are very, very helpful to us. Any comments on the um, I, I don't really have much to add. I think um, I want to echo all the uh, comments about um, bringing sort of any of those stories and how the policy really impact locally is very important. I think some of the most effective meetings I've set on um, concerns uh, low power FM radio stations where the chairman is very supportive of expanding, removing existing restriction that was put in place back in 2001 that limited the number of low power FM 
uh, radio stations and some of the stories with local operators coming in and talking about how they are able to provide emerging services when full power stations go down, how they are able to serve specific uh, minority communities and making sure they're all staying connected. I think those are very powerful stories and certainly very useful for members. And <clears throat> I would just briefly add, you know, two things. First is me, you know, to kind of build on what was already said is to, you know, quantify, you know, the qualitative nature, I guess. If that makes any sense. It probably doesn't because it didn't really make sense to me. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, just, again, rationalizing, but showing the impact that arts has, you know, to the economy, to education. Uh, you know, certainly we've talked, you know, pretty extensively with the National Endowment of the Arts, and, you know, we are seeing, you know, with the various state budget deficits that are occurring, you know, one of the first things that uh, states do is they cut arts programs at schools. And we, uh, you know, it's, you know, we kind of say, well, all oh, it's nice, but there is kind of that, un, you know, fundamental component that really, that arts and music play in a person's life or in a student's life to enhance their educational uh, aptitude in learning environment. I think that's sometimes unfortunately lost. And I would also say, Another aspect, that I don't know how other offices work, but certainly with my boss, you know, an opportunity is to, you know, reach out to the state or district offices. Uh, you know, my boss has several state offices uh, throughout Maine, and that's another way. If you're not always able to um, come to D.C., you know, engaging with the state staff also is another way uh, to, to continue the uh, discussion or the dialogue in regards to how important arts and music are to, to the nation. So when we found out that we were going to have this distinguished panel, we did reach out to our Twitter followers and also to our friends to see if they had questions that they wanted us to ask them. And we've already touched on two of the questions that have come in, uh, one of which is we got a bunch of questions overnight about the LPFM legislation that you just mentioned, Sean, uh, which passed the House last year and seems to be moving through the Senate. Is this the year when hundreds of new low-power radio stations will be authorized, and what can the community do to help? I would certainly hope so, but um, again, that's a question better to ask to my my distinguished Senate colleagues. Um, I think uh, I think maybe more than one senator is holding up the bill. I'm not quite sure about the status. So anyway, uh, the House has taken up the legislation. We worked in a very bipartisan manner. It was a, a unanimous voice vote on the House floor. Uh, passing the bill, and we certainly hope that this will be something that can be enacted this year, and we're ready to do so. <laughs> the other, uh, another question um, from your perspective: Can you talk about what you see as the big picture? And we've kind of been talking a little bit about it with respect to the arts. How does Washington relate to the arts and culture sector? Um, and this is actually putting a finer point on the question, is it clear when you're hearing from artists, whether you're hearing from the copyright industry, which is sometimes actually uh, multinational corporations, um, rather than kind of like artists themselves and arts advocates, like are you, are you noticing the distinction between those kinds of storylines? Um, and what do you think kind of generally is, uh, is, is Washington's impression of the arts community? I will say that I think we hear from the corporations all the time, but the stories that stick with us are the stories of individuals who've uh, had to struggle to make it and, and who have made it or whose fates depend on what we in Washington do. I think uh, you'll find when talking to members of Congress that it's those encounters with people out there trying to make a living doing what they love that stick with them the most. And that's why it's important, I think, to, to make sure your voices are heard in that regard. Um, the corporations will always be there. I think you know, members of Congress are always thinking about broader economic issues and, and broader policy issues, but it is those personal stories which, which stick with us the most. Yeah, I would echo that. And to the point, and I don't want to speak authoritatively, but uh, as to what Washington and thinks of the rest of the, the artistic community, their artistic community outside of Washington, and what they think of Washington, I think DC is also often in the posture of trying to play catch up. You know, we're trying, as the internet evolves and um, artists disseminate their uh, creative work and, you know, just 
ever growing an ever growing number of ways we're trying to you know make the law try and catch up so it's difficult for us I think um, we'd love to get out in front of it uh, but one of the you know questions that's always burdening us is how can we make sure from a you know from the, the standpoint of property how can we make sure that artists you know work is still being protected as these new ways of disseminating it develop so I would say um, with a resounding volume, I guess it was a dumb statement, but uh, that everybody loves working with the arts community. I've not met a member of Congress that doesn't really enjoy those meetings, and I think that that is something that you all could really capitalize on. I think that we meet with a lot of people that we don't want to meet with that we have to meet with, and I think <laughs> the fact that they, that they actually want to meet with you is pretty huge, and I think that as long as um, you're engaging often and um, really um, making sure you're building the relationships with the staff. Um, you know, I think that you can't go wrong. I, I think the people that I um, work with the most are the issues that are most at the forefront of my mind. I mean, that's just natural. We all have a lot in our plates. I know committee staff's a little different, but I handle six issues, and that's, you know, a lot to keep up with to make sure you're on top of everything, and, and I think engaging and ensuring that we have that continue to have a positive relationship and maybe f fan it out a little bit bigger um, as we go into next Congress is really critical, um, especially in the state of the economy the way it is. Um, I think it's we need to be a, a proactive community in a way to explain that you know the arts cannot always be the first thing that's going to go. Um, and you know I think that the resounding message that I could give to you all is that. Um, we want, we love to meet with you. Um, meeting, I mean, having um, any sort of um, arts connection to me, and I've seen it, like I said earlier, um, you know, right in front of me, that people have a really positive reaction. And I think that in politics, it's hard to find that reaction on a lot of issues. And I think that that is something to capitalize on. And I'm happy to, as a, you know, in my capacity as the Arts Caucus staffer, to help you in any way to talk through the best ways to do that, you know, offline or whatever. And um, but I really think that tap into that positive positivity would get get us pretty far. Questions from the audience. Uh, I think one of uh, I think you touched a, a bit on on something that that I think is 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 a big concern uh, I mean I've seen um, you know it's it's the the entire um, the entire economic situation is so particularly in the last year is so Im impactful um, a lot of the arts a lot of the musical community you know works on on day jobs I know my day job has become more more intermittent and, and my economic situation is is such yeah, you know, in, in the past year, I don't want to go into it, but um, but it's it's basically uh, you know it's it's basically n not just you know cuts about arts or whatever, but in improving the overall uh, economic situation and making it in some way easier. It, you know, in in the in the tax code, I'm, I've been, I'm involved with an organization that supports one of its functions is supporting the arts, and we're trying to fill out our 1023, and it's like, I, I'm like, we were like, we were going over it line by line for four hours the, on Sunday, me and a friend of mine, and it was just, you know, we don't know how we're get, gonna get nonprofit status. You know, it's it's that sort of thing. If, 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 there's, if there's ways that, you know, that, that Congress, and and the laws can be written in such a way as to simplify things and and not so much stand in the way. I think a lot of progress can be made, and that's just my only question and comment. Thanks. Any reaction? We'll move on to the next question. Cheryl. Hi. Thanks everybody for coming. This is a. Uh, really interesting panel. I just wanted to um, ask a question because uh, earlier this week we saw a fairly remarkable release from Chairman Waxman, Senator Rockefeller, uh, leaders on the Commerce Committee about 
opening a process to think about rewriting the Communications Act. And I wondered if, um, not to just put Sean on the spot, but wondered if maybe Sean could talk a little bit more about what he might anticipate. I know it's early because you just announced this process beginning. But in particular, I ma imagine it's somewhat driven by the whole net neutrality debate and the reclassification debate, trying to give people an outlet to have that conversation on the Hill. But I wondered if there was any, some of the other media issues that have historically really dominated debate on the Hill. We've got the FCC reconsidering media consolidation rules this year. The court has just suspended the rules. So now the, the, the old administration's rules are going to go into effect. We've got the NBC Comcast merger, which I know has um, received some attention up there. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that process and maybe generally speaking what you think the appetite is for some of the non-broadband media issues on the Hill, particularly maybe even next year. I mean, I know we're, we're you know, it's, it's still early this year, but I know the elections are right on the horizon as far as, as a lot of this work is concerned. I, I, I really, I don't have a lot of information to share. I mean, the, the, um, when Chairman Rockefeller and Chairman Waxman came out with their statement uh, back in May supporting um, the FCC's effort, including reclassification, they also indicated at the same time that Congress is ready and willing to take a, a serious look at any efforts at rewriting uh, the, the Communications Act. Now, in terms of the scope, in terms of the exact process, um, the only thing I know is that we're going to try to approach it in a bipartisan manner. We're going to start having these meetings and hearing sessions that start um, uh, paving the way for eventual rewrite. But I, I can't really tell you how many subsets of issues are going into it. Uh, um, um, I can assure you that this doesn't meant to be a substitution of the process that's undergoing over at the FCC. We meant it to be complementary, and we, we hope that um, there is a proper role for Congress to play in this regard, and there's certainly a role to, for for the FCC to play as well. So, um. well, there, yeah, it certainly could be you know pretty encompassing given all the different uh, provisions and titles under the Communications Act. I will say, you know, from uh, the Title II classification aspect, I think a rewrite does provide. Um, uh, greater certainty in in regards to this issue because the FCC does lack the strategic tools tool set necessary. Uh, and I give the example is, you know, what Chairman Janikowski is doing could easily be retracted by the next makeup of the commission. I mean, it could, uh, you know, or a commissioner could say, well, instead of you know, the next chairman could say instead of title two light, we we'll go title two medium. Uh, I mean, so there is a lot of uncertainty there that I think is an opportunity for the FCC, uh, or excuse me, for Congress to play a better role in, in greater leadership by that because I, there has been a growing dialogue around the need for a rewrite because we have seen, you know, kind of a, you know, a more archaic uh, policy for the spectrum aspect. You know, we are seeing that, you know, a lot of these provisions under Title II were written back in 1934 when the Internet didn't even wasn't even close to being in existence. So there are opportunities to do that. And I think one of the things is it will provide an opportunity for all the various stakeholders to really work together. Uh, I mean, I know I'm being very naive in saying that because obviously you see, you know, a lot of uh, defense playing and, and opposition, but in working together in, in, a, in achieving the common goals we all share. I mean, I, I think that's one of the things that, it, that is getting muddied in this whole discussion because I think everyone is in complete accord, accord. Let's do what we can in a program manner to provide, you know, more affordable, uh, higher speed band, broadband to everyone. I mean, that, I mean, it's so empowering and so important uh, that we should really do that. And, you know, we have to work together, though. That's the great thing. I mean, not, you know, the private sector can't do it alone. The public sector can't do it alone. And that's where we have to really work in concert uh, to better address this. And, you know, another issue is with USF. I mean, my boss being one of the co-founders of the E-Rate program, which has wired, I think, 100 percent of the, of the schools across the nation with Internet access, uh, there is a need to, you know, improve the processes there to do more of a tectonic shift to broadband because broadband, not, you know, flash cut, but more of a phased approach for broadband. She co-sponsored legislation that uh, Chairman Rockefeller and uh, Ranking Member KBH uh, Hutchison introduced uh, to incorporate a lifeline broadband program, a uh, pilot program. So there are a lot of different things we can do that we can really kind of work together on this. And I, I, I'm 
you know, again, being naive, but very optimistic about that opportunity. Yes, um, I have a question. I guess this is, comes from uh, Matthew's statement, and it's also for Maggie and anybody else, but uh, particularly you two. Uh, you said something about quantifying the qualitative. And, and to me, like, as, as somebody who's interested in, um, in, say, the humanities and its impacts on the economy, there's a gut belief that there is a connection, right? And, and a very distinct connection in this, uh, a lot of people, whether it's Richard Floyd and a lot of people have investigated this, yet there's no metrics. So beyond the narratives, is there any, is there any hope for getting some metrics on this that, or, or maybe even some, uh, some stories of people who've tried to bring uh, quantitative aspects of the qualitative experiences they've had that have helped reshape a city or an economy? Uh, that, that has impacted legislation? I mean, I will say, you know, the center, you know, my boss really enjoys having a lot of detailed information. And I, I mean, I can't recall specifics, but I know when we have, when I have provider material on the arts, there have been reports out there. I mean, they're kind of, or studies. I mean, they're, uh, you know, not a lot of them, uh, at least in the searches I've done. But I remember hearing, you know, uh, if, you know, uh, women that are pregnant, when they listen to music while, you know, they're pregnant, that there, you know, there is data showing the improvement in the aptitude of the baby. And uh, so I think there are those, but I guess it's, you know, it, it goes to the point of, iter you know, reiterating that, repeating that multiple times so it can really sink in because, you know, I mean, this is obviously a very important issue, a very important uh, part of the community of constituents. But at the same time, there's so many other groups out there competing also on their issue as well. And so sometimes that's, it resonates more when you hear it uh, at, a, you know, at a higher frequency. You know? Yeah, and um, <clears throat> for, for me, last year I met with a, a woman who was, had gone through kind of halfway through a project, kind of looking to start polling to figure out the effect of the arts on specific communities. Uh, she was based out of Ohio, I think. Um, and she kind of just came to say, hey, is this worth me continuing to invest in? Um, she was, you know, underwriting the whole uh, project, which most people can't do. Um, and then I said, of course, heck yes, please do. You know, we don't have anything that in, in terms of, it, it's a hard to, to make the issue more tangible. And I think um, that why our message to you all is talking about how make sure you can try and connect with the staff or the, or the member on a personal level, because that's what we have to make, to, to kind of be the impetus for change. Um, I have not heard uh, from this woman in a while. I'm not sure if they finished it. I'm sure it's a more of a longitudinal study. But I think um, it's definitely something to look into um, from our perspective. You know, uh, is this uh, the sort of study or a longitudinal um, analysis that could be done? Um, the hard part is here is the reality of the economic situation. And so, you know, we kind of need a, a, a more of an uptick to, to even start talking about a, a study of that magnitude, but I, I think that um, it's definitely something we don't have to, to point to, but we do have, um, you know, the, the personal stories that, that are much more impactful than, um, say, another interest group or, or something like that. Does that answer your question? We have time for a few more questions. Michael, are there any questions from the webcast? <laughs> We've got elections coming up, and I know that you all have a lot on your plate. I know that you're not in the game of making predictions, but um, how do you think? How do you see things playing out for the rest of the year? <laughs> um, I'm thinking very positively. That's all I'm going to say about it. <laughs> I think it's going to be a battle, but we'll uh, we'll see. It's definitely not a. a a, uh, an easy road going for us, and by us I mean the majority. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we got a question right there. Um, I think that uh, oftentimes, kind of politicians and music artists are in a little bit of the same boat because they're both sort of responsible, or um, yeah, I guess responsible to a certain community. 
And uh, in the case of the musician, it's their fan base. And in the case of the politician, it's their uh, constituency. And um, I'm just curious about, in your guys' experience with uh, dealing with elected officials, how much of an influence maybe certain artists that they like or uh, artists that are popular in their home uh, state or wherever their constituency is, how much of an influence maybe that plays or do they, uh, do they like play music in the office or that, that sort of thing? I'll field this one. Um, every meeting, I don't know if any of you have ever met with Chairman Conyers, but literally every meeting you will have with him or have had with him will have John Coltrane or Miles Davis playing in the background. Um, for him, uh, you know, the arts is absolutely personal. He was a bass player. He still claims to be a bass player um, and then a politician. Uh, and I think, you know, he for Mr. Kiners, he connects everything back to justice, and um, I think he sees, you know, the arts as as a way to move justice forward. Uh, and he, you know, I think he would count among his, you know, most important legislative contributions during his more than 40 years in Congress was uh, getting jazz uh, designated as a national treasure. And there's a jazz club here in D.C. H.R. 57, which uh, bears the name of that bill. Um, and he's always talking about H.R. 57 and how proud he is of it and how proud he is of artists in Detroit um, and, and the importance that the jazz has, um, has in the kind of greater American psyche. Other questions? We wore you out, didn't we? Well, we're wrapping up then. Uh, we're towards the end of the day. I'd love to invite all of our panelists to say a few closing words. We can start at uh, the end with Daniel. Sure. sure just to, uh, to conclude, I guess I, I would agree with my colleagues here that uh, the quantitative is important, and that is often what drives the agenda in Congress. Uh, I, I will reiterate, though, that I think the qualitative and the stories, the, the, the personal stories that members of Congress hear is what sticks with them. I, I think Chairman Conyers is a great example of that. Senator Durbin also, before he was uh, a member of Congress, owned a music nightclub. And so when he hears folks talk about trying to make a living uh, in the music industry, um, trying to, to get by, I think that is something that he understands in his gut. And I, I do think that it, it's those types of, of stories which uh, can influence people's decision making up, up in Capitol Hill. You know, you, you talk about the impact that musicians can have, you know, you, you see the Bonos and the folks who have made, I, I think, incredible uh, change happen um, in a positive way. Uh, you don't always hear the stories about the constituents who come up to members of Congress in their district and, and shake their hand and just say, let me tell you a little bit about what I'm facing and what I'm going through and I hope you can help. Uh, that happens all the time. That does have an impact. I would encourage you to get out and do that. I would echo what uh, everyone has set up here. I think the question about what's happening in the next election, I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's determined by voters. And if, you know, we know that a lot of people are drummed up for this next election, and I think it's important that the issues that, that you all are, are working towards are become part of uh, the questions that are asked of the candidates. Um, so keep up the good work and, and don't stop talking to us, I would say. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, the best way for, for me at least, uh, for, you know, the next year outlook um, after the election and, um, you know, is basically going to continue to be to try and reframe our, our debate here on the Hill. I, uh, you know, we've got members that are very passionate about the arts, including all of our bosses, and we're very lucky to work for them. And I think there are a lot of folks that are, are also very passionate but aren't quite sure how to engage. And I think that the most critical thing we can do is to talk and meet. And I know we're being redundant, but it, it just underlines how critical it is, um, it, you know, in order to make those relationships. And if you have a staffer that you can call, even with a, an inkling of a thought about something <coughs> that you might be worried about, and they'll respond to you and talk with you and talk, bring it to the boss, I mean, that's that's invaluable in terms of actual pol pol policy change around the arts. And I think that establishing relationships is something that um, is, would be really great uh, to focus on and to bring the, um, you know, make sure that the musicians are talking to all the members and, um, you know, in the state or here in D.C. I think uh, making that effect and getting that impact is, is critical. Thanks. Uh, 
I agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I would say, you know, it, it, at least, for, uh, uh, you know, I'm given that I, uh, you know, advise the center primarily on telecommunications issue, I take it from a technical standpoint. I think it's a very contentious time in telecommunications, but also a very exciting time because there is so much going on and we're really just at, you know, at the beginning of, of what we're seeing in regards to innovation that will be coming down. I mean, you know, we talked about the internet, you know, about 1.6 billion internet users. Well, there are over 4 billion cell phone users. And just to think about that and when we see this migration of all these wireless devices becoming connected to the internet, it's just going to be a, a, a fascinating uh, environment and future. And, and certainly my boss, again, being a champion of network neutrality, ensuring that unfettered open ac access to the internet so that you continue to have, uh, you know, the ability to reach your, your fan base and, uh, and really being able to collaborate with a, a whole host of different uh, people and, and individuals is just very exciting and something we look forward to working with, with all the various stakeholders regarding this. And certainly, you know, the FCC it's going to, you know, there's a lot of action over there, but certainly what they are about to embark on with the national broadband plan is, is certainly a huge undertaking that will they'll be seeking a lot of public comment on, and that's another avenue for all of you to weigh in as well, uh, regardless if it directly affects you or not. It's an opportunity to again uh, weigh, you know, weigh in and give your voice uh, to the whole uh, public policy process. I think I just want to thank you all for having me, and it's always great to have a, this sort of dialogue and discussion. And um, not to point fingers, but I do think I think ha engaging with, with the FCC would be great. I think engaging with the Senate would be even better. <laughs> so we can actually shake a couple of bills loose yeah. and uh, getting enacted. So yeah. yeah, I will say you know it is you know we are known as the more deliberative body, <laughs> like to my house friends. But I mean this just shows. I mean there are, I think at least at least 250 bills that have passed the House that have not yet been taken up by the Senate. And I think it's the point, I forgot who mentioned it, but just how, you know, valuable that floor time on the Senate is because one senator can just hold it, you know, disrupt the whole process. And I guess that's, you know, can be, a, you know, a bad thing if you're trying to expedite the passage of the bill, but a good thing if you, you know, really want to make sure this issue is, is, is really uh, properly addressed. So, I mean, it, it is pretty crazy, but it's, it's one of those things where certainly uh, my boss is, looks forward and continues to have a, a, a great working relationship with the House. She actually started over in the House. So, uh, you know, she by no means is a Senate snob. She loves, you know, both sides and understands that both, you need both houses in order to pass legislation and get it enacted. So. so I was taking some notes when you guys were talking during your panel specifically about the question of um, what you would like to see the arts community do more of. And uh, so you can feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to tell you what I wrote down. Maggie would like arts folks to talk to the Arts Caucus about why net neutrality is important. Uh, Benjamin welcomes any support for the Performance Rights Act. And he also supports artists putting out the story about how net neutrality and copyright protection are not necessarily opposed. And uh, that Maggie suggests that we talk more about how artists impact local communities. And Daniel would just like for you to visit him more often. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I'd like for you guys to give a great big hand to our panel. Thank you so much for taking time to join us today. We do have some housekeeping as uh, we break up for the day. Uh, we are going to Science Club, which is at 1136 19th Street. It's literally around the corner and half a block north from this building on 19th Street. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were uh, that we thanked uh, New America Foundation and the staff for being wonderful partners in our policy day today. A uh, reminder that October 3rd through 5th, we're going to be at Georgetown University with our three-day policy summit. And, uh, oh, and everybody should have gotten evaluations with your program. It looks like this. Please tell us how we're doing. We take these really seriously, and we do appreciate any and all feedback that you can give us about our programs. And I believe the last thing I'm supposed to say is, oh, 
that Future of Music Coalition has a newsletter where we talk about a lot of these issues, everything that you've heard today, and more. Uh, please feel free to sign up if you're not already a member. Thanks, everybody, for a wonderful day.